Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Y'all give these guys a hand. I want to echo what Edward said, man. I, I just I love what God's doing in our worship team right now, and to see students come up and lead is just, that's so exciting. And uh, just for all you volunteers, thank you very much. Well, Edward mentioned um, the week that, uh, that's been going on up here. It's been a crazy, crazy week. Um, Man, so for me personally, um, it's been uh, a roller coaster. I have literally uh, felt and experienced every single emotion that a human being can experience in this week, okay? And, and really, in each day of each week, I've, I've been angry, I've been sad, I've been scared, I've been happy, I've been joyful and excited and uh, uh, compassion, uh, just all wrapped up in one. I have had the opportunity this week uh, to minister to a lot of people, and I know you're looking at me and say, well, that's your job, okay? Yeah, I get it, all right? But this week, more than ever, has been just like extra, extra stressful, and there's just been a lot of stuff going on, not only in our church, but in my life and in my community. I have lots of different communities. I'm finding out I have my Summit Heights family. Uh, I have my Crucible community. I have my small group community. I have a community out uh, in Hawkins where my kids go to school. There's families that Ashley and I rub shoulders with that don't attend Summit Heights, and we get to love on them and, and minister to them as well. I have my extended family. Uh, I have friends. I, it's just so, it, it, it's, it's, it's wide ranging. And um, just to kind of give you a brief context, I have spent this week uh, finding myself ministering to a lot of people. So I've had uh, a couple friends in my life that have been hurt this week um, emotionally. Uh, a, a friend of ours, Edward mentioned the funeral that was here yesterday, is a good friend of ours and he attends church here. Many of you know him. Uh, they lost their granddaughter tragically a week and a half ago and we had the service here yesterday and just um, talking with him and, and being there for him and, and pouring into him. Uh, a couple of other friends of mine that are really struggling right now uh, that I've just been able to connect with and talk to and, and, and try to encourage and then, um, you know, there, there have been people in, in the community that that, that have reached out to me and said, hey, can I talk to you? I had two, two instances this week where uh, men have said, I need to talk to you. And the first thing that goes through your mind is, oh, crud, what did I do to make these men mad? Uh, but both of them were broken. Both of them were struggling and just needed somebody to talk to. And you become aware in these times of, of, of where God has planted you and how he wants to use you, okay? But something else has occurred this week in the midst of that is I've also become aware of my own brokenness and my own issues and my need as a man, as a human being, to be ministered to. Now listen to this. This is important. I have a community of men that I meet with twice a month, our elder board. And it was so refreshing uh, for us as elders. We literally went into elder meeting and Edward said, you know what, here's the agenda. And he just began to scratch stuff off the agenda. Got it down to two items. We talked about those two items and then the rest of the time the elders just 
ministered to Edward and I because they knew the week that we were having, and that is so refreshing. And it made me become aware of those times in my life where I don't need to be the one pouring out. I actually have my own brokenness and my own issues, and I need people pouring into me. Uh, I have Edward. Edward and I spend more time texting and on the phone and in person than anybody else in my life. And just those times where we can just connect and, and, and feed off each other. And then here's the crazy, craziest thing that happened. This happened Friday. The man that came to me Tuesday who was broken and needed my support actually was there for me Friday when I was about spent and out of gas. And then he began to minister to me. And I tell you all of this because... This is why I choose community. We've been in a sermon series for five weeks now, relaunching our small groups. And we're talking about the importance of community and being in community. Because this journey that we're on, this Christian life that we're all trying to leave takes a lot of twists and turns along the way. There's good times and bad times and everything in between. You've been there. You've had those seasons of your life where you are pouring into people and God is using you to minister to other people. And if you have not had those seasons in your life, you need to pursue that because Edward and I are not the only ones God has called to minister to people at Summit Heights. There's this thing called the priesthood of every believer, that every believer in Christ is a priest in and of themselves, and that you have the same access to God that Edward and I do through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have a calling on your life, whether you acknowledge it or not, to be there for other people in their times of need. You've been there, but there's also been those times in your life where you need to be the one that people are ministering to. We all have seasons of life that we go through where we need support and we need help. Well, today we're going to launch our groups. Today we're going to be talking about small groups, and we're going to give you an opportunity at the end of the service to go and to meet our small group leaders and to choose community. We want you to be intentional about choosing community. You see, our small groups exist for three areas here at Summit Heights. Number one, we want people to grow in intimacy with God. We want people to grow in their relationship with God. We believe that God planted us here so that we can connect people to God. And so our small groups exist to give each and every one of you an opportunity to do that, to find a group of people to connect with and then grow in your relationship with Christ. But number two is we want you growing in community with insiders. Our purpose statement is complete by saying this, we exist to connect people to God and others through relationship. So we want you growing in community. And then third, we want you growing in influence with outsiders. And so we want you in groups because we want you growing in Christ. We want you growing with each other, and we want you influencing the outside world with the gospel of Christ. Well, today, and what I'm going to talk about today funnels out of the filter of what I've experienced this week. Because I believe if we're going to grow in Christ and we're going to have influence in our outside world, we have to be growing in community. It is the most important thing, I believe, in our discipleship walk. Because I believe the closer we get to each other and the closer we are in community, the growth in Christ and the influence with the outside world takes care of itself. If we'll choose to be intentional in community, we will grow in Christ. If we choose to be intentional in community, Hang on. Sorry. You there? All right. Good deal. We will influence our outside community if we choose community. A verse I've always struggled with, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Some of uh, the translations say carry one another's burdens and so fulfill that law of Christ. But what 
does that actually look like? See, I'm an action guy. Like, I like to, like, do things. I'm a visionary. I like to dream. I like to put things into motion. I don't like to just read verses and then just leave it. I'm always asking the question, what does that look like? Like, how do you do that? Like, there's this verse in the Bible that says, take your thoughts captive and make them obedience to Christ. Okay, how? What does that look like? And this verse has always, I've always struggled with this because I want to carry burdens, I want to bear one of somebody's burden. I believe that's a call God's placed in my life. But what does it actually look like to do that? And what does it look like to do that in the context of community? Because I believe above all else, if we're going to be a church of small groups, if we're going to be a church where people are in community and they're growing in community and they're ministering to others, and you're being ministered to, we've got to be able to be a people that carries one another's burdens. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 2, and I'm going to walk you through, for some of us, a very familiar story in the Bible. If you've never heard this story before, it's going to, it's, it's an awesome, it's an awesome story. Jesus is, uh, is preaching, and there's a group of men that do something that if they did it today, it would just be outlandish. So Jesus is preaching uh, in a house, and we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And it simply says this, uh, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, that he is Jesus. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. So you've got Jesus at home, in a house, in a building, some sort of structure. He's preaching, and they say that it's so crowded in there that you could not even get into the door, okay? And so just get a mental picture of this, okay? Put yourself in the story. Put yourself in the story. You're just a stander by. Maybe you got there early, and you got into the house, and you're looking behind you, and you see, man, this place is packed. And then one of your buddies is texting you outside, dude, I can't even get in. I mean, there's a line all the way to the street. I can't even get in, okay? I mean, that's how packed this place was. And then in verse 3, we're introduced to some men. In verse 3, and they, everybody say they. It's a big word in this story, they. I camped out on that word all week long as I was preparing for this message, and I started thinking about the they's in my life, the them's, the him's, the her's, the people that I do life with. Everybody say they. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, a paralytic, a man that is paralyzed, a man that is helpless. In, in, in those days, uh, the paralytics lived on what we call mats, these little rug-type mats that were probably about the size of just this part of the stage where I'm standing now, from here to here to here. This man that is on this mat, more than likely, he couldn't walk, Okay, it doesn't say whether he had use of his arms or anything, but we know he couldn't walk or he wouldn't be on a mat, okay? And so you have to picture a man or a person, there's a man in this story, but put yourself in the story. You're in the story and you start to hear some commotion outside. You don't really know what's going on out there, but this is what's going on is we have these four men bringing a man who has lived his entire life on a mat, He can't walk. He can't do anything for himself. He can't get a job. He can't take care of himself. He he has to have somebody, if they're willing, to bathe him. He can't do that for himself. He has to have somebody, if they're willing, help him use the restroom, more than likely. He has to have somebody, if they're willing, to feed him. He's stuck. He's trapped 
on a mat. This mat is his entire life. And without the help of people in his life, he could do absolutely nothing. Have you ever felt stuck and trapped? Have you ever, any time in your life, just felt hopeless or I can't do this? Yeah. And not only physically does this guy have issues, but think about the stigma and the label that was placed on this man's life. See, in those days, it was very common for the religious leaders and people of the day to attach like a sin issue with a physical deformity. For instance, remember when uh, the man that was blind and his disciples asked Jesus, hey, who sinned that this man is blind, the parents or him? And Jesus always like, neither. This was done so that you'll see the glory of the God. Same thing. People saw this man as, well, he must be a sinner or his parents must be a sinner because that's why he lives on a mat. That's why God made him disabled. That's why he can't eat by himself and use the bathroom by himself and all that. There must be sin in his life. He was outcasted. He was labeled as something that really he wasn't supposed to be. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that way, like that you've had a label on your life, fairly or unfairly? Okay, maybe not. Have you ever treated somebody that way? Hello. Yeah. This man is just stuck. He can't do anything for himself. And not only that, he's been labeled as a sinner and as a loser. Well, here's what I know. We all have a mat. There's not a person in this room that can say with 100% authenticity and with 100% honesty that there's not some part of our life that doesn't relate to the mat. We all have our own brokenness and imperfections. You know, when Edward was giving the offering talk, some of you saw me run over there and grab a pen because he said, everybody notices brokenness. True. Everybody notices brokenness in others. Very few of us notice our own brokenness. We all have a mat that we carry. Some of us carry the mat of anger. Some of us carry the mat of pride. Some of us carry the mat of depression. Some of us carry the mat of anxiety. Some of us carry the mat, even though we love Jesus and we've been saved and reborn, there's that one sin issue that we struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle with, and we carry that mat. Some of us carry the mat of self-righteousness and greed. We all have seasons in our lives where we feel like we're on a mat. And if, if you're not there and you're like, well, not me, just wait, be patient. Because it will come. There will be times in your life where you feel trapped. There will be times in each and every one of our lives where we're going to need somebody or somebody's or the they's that this story talks about. So in verse 4, And when they could not get near him, that's Jesus, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. These men went to some pretty extreme measures to get their friend to Jesus. Did they not? So you're sitting inside and you're hearing Jesus talk, put yourself in the story. You're texting your buddies outside, dude, it's packed in here. They text back, you ought to see what these dudes are doing. There's four guys carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They're climbing on the roof and they're cutting a hole. And you're looking up, dude, I see it. And then all of a sudden, they lower their friend down to the feet of Jesus. These men went to some extreme measures to get their friend to Jesus. 
roof crashers. Yeah. Anything that it takes to get our friend to Jesus. And I just wonder if we here at Summit Heights could create communities, groups of roof crashers. The type of communities where people carry each other's burdens to so fulfill the law of Christ. That verse that I struggle with, well, how do you do that? Well, these men are showing me. Will you just pick them up, climb a roof, cut a hole in it, and lower him down to Jesus, Jake? I mean, how hard could it be? It says it right there. A community of roof crashers where the theys, sometimes we're the theys, sometimes we're the man on the mat, Sometimes we need carrying. Sometimes we are the ones that are doing the carrying. But we do whatever it takes to get each other to where we need to be. Because here's the deal. The man on the mat, although maybe he had heard of Jesus and maybe he had um, heard of some miracles or maybe he didn't know anything about Jesus, regardless, the man on the mat, even if he knew in the power of Jesus, had no way his brokenness and his stigmas and his, uh, the physical things that were going on in him kept him from getting to Jesus. And he needed men in his life to get him there. Now listen to me. Every one of us in this room more than likely know of Jesus, know that he has the power to do things, but sometimes our brokenness blinds us and keeps us from doing what we know we need to do, which is just move toward Jesus. And it's in those times we need men and women that can come alongside us and pick us up and take us to where we are not going community of roof crashers that will do whatever it takes to get people to where they need to be. That's what these men modeled. And I began to wonder as I read this story, how long had this friendship existed? I mean, this couldn't have been just four ordinary men that walked by and saw a guy on a mat and said, let's pick him up, take him to Jesus' place, climb on a roof, cut a hole, and lower him down. That rarely, if ever, happens now, and it certainly didn't happen in that day, not with the stigma that those men had. These men must have known each other for a long time. See, community takes time. We're going to launch community today, and we're going to relaunch community today, and many of you We're going to get plugged into groups, and here's what I know. Some of you are going to try a group, and then you're not, something's, you're going to move to another group, and you're going to, then you're going to move to another group, or you're going to get in a group, and you're going to say, well, I don't feel the community that Jake talks about all the time. It takes time. Some of you are in a community that has been together for years and you're seeing the fruit of it and you're tracking with me. You're like, man, I know what he's talking about. And some of you don't. Listen, it's okay. It takes time. Today might be the first step for you to get to a place where two years down the road, you are a roof crasher. It takes time. Don't be afraid to take the step. Choose community. We're going to give you an opportunity today to do that because we all have mats. We all have our own issues and we all have the brokenness and we need people in our lives, even if we don't recognize it. Here's what I know to be true. I hope I don't get off on a tangent here. I know we're on a time. The people in our lives that are closest to us, wives, husbands, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, really close friends, know our issues way before we do, okay? It's amazing when self-awareness comes online and you begin to really look at yourself and you really begin to see your brokenness and see your issues and then you go to your wife or your husband or your friend you say man I need to tell you something I just learned this about myself bam and you spill it out there and they just sit back and go well yeah (laughs) everybody could see that we all have it 
And if we'll choose to take a step, a risky step, to be in community, we can surround ourselves with people that can carry us in those burdens. We can also be on the outside of that mat and be people that carry other people. It's just, it's a weird dichotomy that goes on in this Christian life. It's that example that I told you about where on Tuesday, I am carrying a brother in his burden and in his brokenness and in his pain, and I'm pouring out to him. And then Friday, I am spent, I am broken, I'm ready to quit, I'm done, let's move, let's sell cars, let's work at Burger King, Let's do anything but this. And then that man that I had carried on Tuesday was there to pick me up and carry me along. It's such a cool thing, tension that we live in in Christian community. But it only happens in community. Choose community. Put yourself in a place where God can use you to carry another man or another woman or another couple's burdens and then allow yourself to see your own brokenness and your own need to be carried at some point. Choose community. Today we're launching groups, roof-crashing communities where men and women and couples can come together and grow in intimacy with God, where they can grow in community with insiders and they can grow with influence with outsiders. I'm so excited about what we're launching this semester at Summit Heights. We have the largest opportunity for groups that we've ever had. Multiple men's ministries that are going to be kicking off this fall with a table right over here. If you're a man and you want to get connected into a roof crashing community with other men, then you need to go to this table when I give you instructions later on. And you need to meet some of the leaders and put your name on a sheet of paper and take that step. Women's groups and women's ministries over here uh, that meet different flavors, Bible journaling groups groups and Bible study groups and uh, mentoring opportunities and you need to take a step to get connected. Ladies, you need other ladies in your life that can be there for you and that you can be there for him. We have some specialty groups that uh, our grief support ministry that focuses just on grief that meets once a month. Around the throne prayer ministry that meets every Monday morning. They go back into that room back there in A101. They worship and then they pray over every prayer request. And if you think I'm lying, you think I'm trying to be dramatic, you can feel the presence of God all the way up there in my office on Monday morning when those men and women meet because it is so powerful. And you think And they'll testify to this, and two of the leaders are sitting right there. You think you're gathering to minister and praying for other people to help them, which you are, but then you also begin to feel the ministering power on yourself, and you get fed as well. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And then we have all types of community groups that meet. Some meet on Saturday night, some meet on Sunday, some meet on the second and fourth Wednesday, second and fourth Tuesday. Uh, we have an online group that's a, that's a web-based study that you get emails and you can go at your own pace and get into the Word and then they meet and all of those tables are over there. And I say all that because you need to choose community. I'm amazed at what happens when groups of people who love Jesus band together for a purpose of roof crashing to get people to Jesus. So let's put ourselves back in the story. So we're over here and we've been texting our friend outside and he was right. He said, look what's about to happen. The roof busts open and this man comes down. So what happens? Verse 5. It says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit 
that they thus question within themselves said this to him. Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your mat and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say, rise, pick up your mat and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his mat and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never have seen anything like this. What happens when you're in a roof crashing community? Well, a couple of things. Number one, you find healing, sometimes physical, but always spiritual and emotional. You can find healing in community. It's a, I, I'm amazed at the times when my spirit is broken. And I can only speak from experience. I can't speak for any of you. I can only speak for myself. But for me, I'm amazed at those times where my spirit feels broken. And, um, and I know it's not. I know that, that God's spirit is there. I'm just talking about my own when I let my own stuff get to me, I'm amazed at the healing that comes when I'm connected in community. When I choose to isolate is when I really, really get overwhelmed with brokenness. But when I pursue community Friday, when I picked up the phone and I don't know why I had the audacity to call the one man who I knew was broken <laughs> three days before, but I did. When I choose to be intentional, I choose to be in community, and I choose to be authentic. Remember, we can recognize other people's brokenness. Very rarely do we see it in ourselves, but when I choose to see it in myself, and I choose to be authentic in those communities, and I choose to say, this is me, I'm on a mat. I'm amazed at who in my life comes around me to pick that mat up and take me to the place, the only place where I can find healing. Now, in this story, it was physical. I get that. But for me personally, I've never experienced a physical healing, but I have experienced emotional healing over and over and over again. But then there's also that spiritual healing that you find in community. Jesus heals spiritually. Jesus came first and foremost. You know this, right? Jesus' mission first and foremost was not to come and heal people physically. He did that as a testimony to what he ultimately could do spiritually. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to restore the relationship between God and man that had been broken for so, so long. The physical healing and all that other stuff is just icing on a cake that we get to be in relationship with God the Father through him. That's why when the men brought the broken man to Jesus, his first thought was, your sins are forgiven. That's why he came. That's why he died, ultimately was going to die, so that our sins could be forgiven. It wasn't until people started questioning his authority did he heal him physically. Folks, in community, you can find healing in Jesus. It may look different for you than it does for me, but it's there. So number one, you find healing. Number two, God is glorified in roof-crashing communities. Look at verse 12. And when he rose and picked up his mat and went out before them all, they were all amazed, and they, the people in the room, glorified God. Other people glorified God, the God that we serve, the God that we desperately want to take out into our work our home, our schools, our communities will be glorified by other people only when we are in community doing what God has called us to do. When we're in community and we're carrying each other and healing takes place, that's when the gospel gets spread because people see the real Jesus living out in us. That's how we influence outsiders and bring Christ to the communities. So my question for you today is, will you 
choose community? Will you take a step and go to one of these tables and choose community? Before we do that, I want to um, give you some instructions around uh, communion. We're going to invite the band to come back, and uh, we're going to close like we do every Sunday by taking community, or communion. But what I want to do is I want to give you some very specific instructions because oftentimes we use this as an opportunity to respond to the message, and we have elders and we have prayer team lined up. We're not going to do that today because your response today will be uh, late here in a little bit when we um, invite you to go to those tables and uh, look for a group. Uh, but we're going to take communion. So I invite you to close your eyes and I'm going to pray. And then we're going to give you an opportunity to take communion. And here's what we're going to ask you to do. We want you to go and take communion. Oftentimes we are already do this, but communion is, is a part of worship. And it is a part of what we believe we do in community. We take communion in community and so we're going to give you an opportunity to do that and then I'm going to invite you to come back and sit down and then I will come back and close the service so let's pray well father your instructions were clear as you sat with your community of men and you took the bread and you took the cup. You said, when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we do it in remembrance of you. God, what an awesome picture of community that you gave us. And so as we take this first opportunity to respond, we want to respond to you in remembrance of the sacrifice that you made for us. So as we take the elements, God, would you be glorified? As we take the elements in community, God, would your presence be felt? I pray over each and every person here today. That you would meet them wherever they are on the journey of life the journey of Christianity, the journey of discipleship, wherever they are. I pray, God, that you would give them the courage to do what we've talked about today. Number one, recognize their own brokenness and their own issues and be willing to be carried by others. Number two, to step into a place of service where they can carry others. May we pursue community and may we do it so that the outside world will glorify you. So Father, be with us as we take communion and then as we come back to wrap up this message and we'll give you the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.